Hi there and welcome to part one of my compilation of Queens of Africa I think you should know about. In part one, I will be counting down from five to one and part two from ten to six. As always, the disclaimer for this countdown is that the list is not in order of hierarchy or assumed importance, but rather a little bit about the queens that I would like to share. And if you're wondering what the point of this video is, it's self-education, hopefully your education, and just a little bit of recognition of Black African excellence. Basically, celebrating Black Africans and their excellence. With that said, let's get started with the list. At number 5 is Queen Tai of Egypt. Queen Tai was born in 1398 and became the Queen of Egypt of the 18th Dynasty. She was wife of the Pharaoh Amenhotep, the third mother of Akhenaten and grandmother of Tutankhamun. Queen Tai was noted to have significant influence by virtue of her husband and son and was involved in inter-country relations in her dealings with foreign rulers who had great admiration for her. She, unlike previous queens, presided at festivals and directed domestic and foreign policy and was further reported to having a lot more power than other queens of Egypt that came before her. She held a number of titles such as hereditary princess, Lady of the Two Lands, King's Wife or Great King's Wife, Mistress of Upper and Lower Egypt, and Mistress of Two Lands. Before Thai, Queen Tai became queen, she was fairly familiar with royalty as she grew up in the royal palace with some reports stating that her father was a provincial priest of Akamun and her mother a priestess. Her power was supported by her intelligence as she was one of the only Egyptian queens to have her names on official acts. It is also noted that ancient Egypt afforded more rights to women and that women were held in high regard as compared to other ancient cultures. Her importance is evident in the statues built in her honor which are the same height as that of the king in a mark of what can be interpreted as her being equal to her husband, the king. Queen Tai had a grand palace built for her at Malkata by her husband, the king Amenhotep III. This is also where they lived and raised their six children, of which two were boys and four were girls. Their firstborn son unfortunately passed and so Akhenaten was first in line to the throne. Queen Tai then took on the title of king's mother after the death of her husband, where she ruled for 38 years. Akhenaten was responsible for the abolishment of old beliefs in Egypt and a monotheistic belief system and although the queen herself believed in many deities or gods, she supported her son Akhenaten, who believed in only one god. She passed away in her early 60s and was buried in the Valley of the Kings, where her mummy is referred to as the Elder Lady. Notably, Queen Tai ruled well before the better known Cleopatra and Nefertiti, who was her son's wife. Queen Tai was held in high regard by her servants, the people of Egypt and even foreign rulers, and was considered one of the most influential women of ancient Egypt. At number four is Queen Aranavalona, the first of Madagascar. Queen Aranavalona was born in 1788 in Madagascar and was a commoner's daughter. Her father was said to be responsible for the failure of a plot to kill the future king, and as a gesture of gratitude, the future king adopted Ranavalona and arranged that she marry his son Radama. Queen Ranavanola was considered as hostile and brutal in her dealings. When Radama became king, Ranavanola was the first of his 12 wives. She, however, did not have any children, making the king's nephew, Prince Rakatobe, next in line to the throne. Being the first wife to the king, Queen Ranavanola's children, regardless of who their biological father was, would be considered the late King Radama's children according to the Malagasy traditions, making the firstborn male next in line to the throne. Queen Ranavanola subscribed to the traditional marina or the tribal way of life, and she managed to garner enough support from traditionalists, including the military, to successfully hold down the palace a few days into the King Radama's passing and then assuming the role of queen on the 12th of June, 1829. She swiftly eliminated any competition to the throne 
by ordering the, the killing of Prince Rakatobe, his mother, and a number of his relatives too. She promoted her traditional beliefs by overturning most of her late husband's policies and procedures to kick out missionaries in Madagascar. She stopped trade agreements with France and England and successfully fought the French Navy. One of the customs practiced under the Queen's rule in order to determine if a person is trustworthy was reported to be the eating of three chicken skin and then followed by the eating of a nut that would cause a person to throw up. And if the person did not throw up all three skins, they were deemed untrustworthy. She was also reported to have ordered the placing of European heads on pikes as a warning to their countrymen of what could become of them should they challenge her. Although the battle was won against foreign invasion, it is alleged that this victory was due to the foreigners falling ill with malaria. Queen Rana Van Lona banned the practice of Christianity in her kingdom. Although allowing existing foreigners to practice any religion of their choice, she declared that, that these religions would not be taught to the natives on the The queen ordered the dangling of 15 Christian leaders over a rocky ravine where the ropes were cut and they fell to their deaths for trying to teach Christianity to natives. She is also reported to have ordered around 50,000 people head out and hunt buffalo. While hunting, these people would have to build roads with very little supplies which resulted in about 10,000 people dying from hunger and exhaustion during a four-month hunt that resulted in zero buffalo being killed. Queen Ranavalona later had a son named Rakota, who was against his mother's practices and attempted to take her life on a number of occasions, albeit in vain as they were all unsuccessful. He went on to become king as per traditional customs in 1861. Despite Queen Ranavalona being regarded as cruel, brutal, and even mad, she is lauded for retaining the country's heritage and culture and defending the island from colonialists who were after the country's natural resources. In a testament to her brutality, it is reported that a barrel filled with gunpowder was accidentally ignited at her funeral, resulting in a number of people losing their lives. At number three is Queen Nzinga. Queen Nzinga was born in Kabasa, the capital kingdom of Ndongo, what is today Angola, in 1581. And she is also known as Anna de Sosa Nzinga. Queen Nzinga was born into royalty with her father being the king of Kabasa, who when Lisbon ordered that Ndongo be subjected and captured in 1571, he countered the expansion of European territory into Dongo and banned European missionaries, which resulted in a four decade long war of resistance. With Queen Nzinga being born a decade into the war, she knew nothing but conflict and went on to become an Amazon, which can be defined as a tall, strong, and often masculine woman and a warrior. She is said to have dressed up in men's clothing and was considered the best politician in the country. This, however, did not sit well with her brother, who assumed the throne after the passing of their father, King Ngola Karensi, and he is reported to have killed the queen's only son and sterilized her. In spite of this, the queen still agreed to assist her brother on the back of a number of defeats to the Portuguese in order to keep her people from becoming slaves. There are varying reports regarding how she became queen, with one stating that due to her being able to speak Portuguese, she was sent to negotiate a treaty with the Portuguese, and on her return, she imprisoned her brother and took over the throne, and another reporting that she became queen when her brother, the king, passed. His passing was considered suspicious and was thought to have been orchestrated by the Portuguese so that they could use her as a puppet. As queen, Queen Nzinga aimed to end the war between the native Ndongo people and the Portuguese. She wanted Ndongo to get diplomatic recognition as well as to establish a trading relationship with Europe. Queen Nzinga was strategic in her dealings as well as inconsistent where she forged an alliance with the Dutch slave traders. She overcame some local resistance for women leaders, particularly from the Mbande tribe and recruited Mbande runaways, runaway slaves as soldiers to fight off local resistance as well as European invasions. She, in contrast, allowed missionaries back into Ndongo after she was baptized Donna Ana de Sosa. 
and supported slave trade, a move that seemingly went against her resistance of European expansion and invasion. In 1623, she abandoned her Christian beliefs and reverted back to native traditional beliefs. This was when she joined forces with the Janga warriors from the southern Kwanzaa River, River Plateaus. She offered refuge to all Portuguese runaway slaves and Kimbaras or African soldiers who received training from the Portuguese. She incited recruits with the promise of land as reward. Queen Zinga managed to gain a sizable army and arsenal of weapons and had convinced a number of chiefs to rebel against the Portuguese as well. She received a warning that a war would follow her failure to return the soldiers enslaved, but she, but she blatantly refused, which eventually led to the guerrilla war that led to Queen Zinga being dethroned and replaced with a puppet ruler. In 1629, Queen Nzinga went into exile and gathered her power as a Tabanza, a title reserved for powerful women in the Janga tribe by marrying the Janga chief, but ended the ritual marriage when the Janga allied with the Portuguese who invaded and destroyed the capital Cabasa. She moved to Matamba that had women rulers in the past and was the main slave trade state in the region. She set out to join forces with the Dutch in order to defeat the Portuguese and supported the region's commercial and political efforts too. She again turned against her allies, the Dutch, after defeating the Portuguese and went on to defeat the very same Dutch by allying with the Portuguese in order to export slaves. In 1656, a peace treaty was entered into with the Portuguese and she converted back to Christianity. Queen Nzinga's policies were carried on successfully until her death in 1663. At number two is Queen Ya Asantewa of Ashante Empire in Ghana. Queen Nana Ya Asantewa was born between 1840 and 1860 in Besase village near Edweso. She was born into the Asona matrilineal royal clan of Edweso in the Ashante region of Ghana and was the firstborn of two children herself and her brother, a friend Panin, who became the chief of the Edweso. She was a respected farmer and would have assumed the position of queen after her mother or grandmother because the Ashante culture initially followed a matrilineal inheritance of the throne. The region, however, faced a number of invasions from the British, resulting in the dethroning of Asanta Heni, or king, as well as a civil war. Queen Ya Asantewa became queen mother in 1880 and had the honor of being the gatekeeper of the Golden Stool. The Golden Stool was a significant emblem of the Ashante people that represented the Kingdom of Ashante, its cultural system, and the Ashante power. She also married one of the seven kings of Ashante, his grandson, further solidifying her royal standing. The Queen Mother is chosen to be the mother of a reigning king, but it should be noted that the queen mother is usually the biological mother or grandmother of the reigning king and is responsible for naming candidates who would be suitable to take over the throne or chiefdom. She is the main advisor to the king, which is the second highest position within the empire. In the role of advisor to the king, the queen mother would assist in the drafting of policies and even assume the role of leader should there be a period of a king's absence or should the next in line be too young to become king? In 1896, Queen of Ashante Asanteni Prempe I and his grandson Kofi Tene were exiled to the Seychelles by the British in an attempt to get the Golden Stool. This was preceded by the Ashante People's Rebellion. It is during this time that Asantewa organized her troops and elevated to the position of Commander-in-Chief of the Ashante Army. She led the army in the early 1900s in the Ya Asantawa War of Independence or the War of the Golden Stool. The fighting was started due to a British representative sitting on the Golden Stool, a gesture that was regarded as insulting to the Ashanti people. The conflict resulted in over 1,000 British and 2,000 African soldiers losing their lives. In an effort to inspire the men, she challenged them to take up arms and if they would not, then the woman would do so instead. This was a tactic that was meant to also challenge the existing gender roles and guilt the men into fighting. She was named Kwaku Dao, the third to the stool, 
who made it difficult for the British to impose their ideologies on the Ashanti people. Queen Ya Asantewa was eventually caught by the British and also exiled to the Seychelles where she passed on in 1921. Her efforts were, however, not in vain as Ghana went on to gain independence in 1957 with the Queen Nana Ya Asantewa being instrumental in the resistance of British harassment. Notably, Ghana became the first sub-Saharan country to gain independence in the post-colonial period and inspired neighboring countries such as Nigeria, Benin, Ivory Coast and Cameroon to gain their independence by the close of, of 1960. She is considered a central figure of freedom, feminism and matriarchy in Africa. At number one is Queen Amenatu of Zazu in Nigeria. Queen Amenatu was born into royalty as the granddaughter of King Zazu no Hiro and the oldest daughter of Queen Bakwa Turunku of the Hausa people, making her a princess of Zazu in what is today Zaria in Nigeria around 1533. In 1549, when she was around 16, she became a Magajia or her mother's successor as queen where she would hold daily councils with other officials and started training with the Zazu military. Although she was a Magajia or successor when her mother Queen Bakwa died in 1566, her younger brother Karama became, became king. While her brother was king, Aminatu served in the military and became the leader of the Zazu military army or soldiers. In 1576, her brother the king died and she became the undisputed ruler of Zazu or the 24th Habe. She ruled for 35 years and is credited with the expansion of her kingdom to being one of the greatest in history. And if you look at modern day Nigeria, the spirit of greatness still follows them. During her reign as a Zazu military leader and later queen of Zazu, Amunetu gained a reputation as a fierce warrior and was allegedly responsible for the initiation of a great number of battles which were aimed at conquering land that would allow her traders safe passage. Zazu was positioned at three major trade corridors in North Africa, which connected the Sahara with the southern forest lands and western Sudan. Her people, the Hausa, were skilled metal workers with the Queen Amuna to introducing metal armor and iron helmets. She built area forts in territories she had conquered as well as, well as fortification of Ganua Amina or Amina's War, most of which were still standing over 400 years later. Queen Aminatu conquered areas between Zazu, Niger and Banu rivers, absorbing states such as Nupe and Kwararafwa. She definitely monopolized the trade route or goods coming into the trade routes, specifically Western products, all coming through Hasua land as a sort of port. Her accumulation of wealth and control of major trade routes added to the characteristics of a formidable leader. She also refused to marry in fear of losing power, but was rumored to take a lover after every conquest of a territory and then either castrate or kill them in the morning after they night together. But to properly honor Queen Amunatu, I can probably say that she was a reckoned with. She held the role of daughter, sister, leader, princess, queen, and lover, and and has been credited with bringing close to the whole of the northern Nigerian region under a single authority. And that brings us to the end of this list. Please be sure to check out part two. I hope you have learned a little something from this video and you have been inspired by the greatness of the queens I have discussed today. Yet another collection of queens who are truly powerful, black and Africans who make me proud to be a woman and even prouder to be an African. Please feel free to let me know what your thoughts on this video in the comments are. Share if you enjoyed the videos and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more African content. Bye.